Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us and for, for, for the third annual Black and Immune Week, a week where we celebrate, amplify, and support Black voices in immunology. Before we begin, we would like to thank our major sponsors who have made this week possible. You can find our full list of sponsors on our, on our website. Don't forget to tweet about our session today using uh, the hashtag BII underscore basic immuno with each word capitalized for accessibility purposes. We will have live captions and ASL interpreters during the sessions. Click on the CC at the bottom of the screen to access captions. You can submit questions through the comments function on the platform, not, not the Q&A. As a reminder, we require all the audience members to be polite and respectful while in the Black and Immuno space. If we see anything offensive, your comment will be deleted. Your, co your comment will be deleted immediately and you will be removed from, our, from the platform. After the conclusion of the week, recorded videos will be posted on our YouTube channel and transcripts will be made available on our website, blackandimmuno.org. My name is Yasin al uh, I am a postdoc in Lucy Walker's lab in UCL uh, here in London, and I am a volunteer for Black and Immuno. I will be the moderator for the basic immunology session today. We have five fantastic speakers here to tell us about their work. They have about 15 minutes for their presentations, and we will follow with five minute questions and answers. Without further ado, let's jump on it. So the first speaker will be um, Diona Williams, originally from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, Diona's early love for science and desire to understand human disease focused her aspirations towards biomedical research. A first generation college student, Diona graduated cum laude from Hofstra University before attending the Albert Einstein College of Medicine for her graduate studies. Three years after pursuing a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, Diona joined the faculty and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular and Comparative Path Pathobiology. Her research focuses on the effects of HIV and comorbid substance abuse on neuropsychiatric diseases, the ability of antiretroviral therapy to effectively limit HIV infection in the brain, and how the immune response shapes neurologic disease during HIV. Diona is passionate about encouraging trainees from underrepresented backgrounds in their, scientific, in their scientific journeys, supporting marginalized faculty as they navigate the academic landscape. Welcome, Dr. Williams, and we're excited to hear your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for the very kind invitation. I'm incredibly excited and delighted to share some of the work um, that I've been pursuing in the last few years. Can you see my slide and the pointer? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you about HIV and how it contributes to cognitive impairment, um, which is not well studied, but really, really interesting. So historically, HIV has been mostly thought about how it contributed to the progression to AIDS, which is the immunodeficient state that occurs when HIV infects um, CD4 T cells and over a period of time, um, that becomes the year's time frame. you're gonna end up um, having a lot of CD4 uh, killing that leads then to um, an immunocompromised, immunocompromised state. Um, this is quite devastating and has really led to a lot of deaths. Um, but we've had a major advance in HIV where we have antiviral therapies or ART. These therapies are designed to inhibit different steps of the HIV life cycle. And when you combine them, so for instance, you give one therapy that prevents the virus from binding to your cell. We give another therapy that inhibits key enzymes like reverse transcriptase or integrase. You can then um, be able to stop HIV in its tracks and completely suppress the virus. This has revolutionized um, the HIV pandemic and really made it a manageable disease. Despite this, however, um, HIV is still a problem today. And in our current HIV state, we have a disease of chronic inflammation rather than immunocompromised. 
Inflammation is not necessarily bad. And in fact, it's incredibly beneficial in the early stages of disease when it's designed to help initiate an immune response in the hopes of quelling or um, eradicating a pathogen. In HIV, you have very early immune perturbations and really essentially all um, innate immune cell types um, as well as adaptive immunity. Um, this occurs in the first hours to days. However, the problem is that this um, immune perturbations kind of persist. And so you move into the chronic phase where you have systemic inflammation. I'm showing you just some of the immune contributions that happen during HIV in the chronic phase, um, elicited by a number of different inflammatory markers that you can measure peripherally. This sustained inflammation go up, goes on to promote tissue damage, um, which causes a devastating sequela. Behind all of this tissue damage and immune activation are macrophages. They are really integral in the immune cells and they're a bridge between the innate and adaptive immune response. They're understudied during HIV, but they're incredibly important because they're present in every organ of the body where they have common roles like um, phagocytosis and antigen presentation, but they also have specialized role in, in these organs. You have them in the tissues as well as in the blood. We have blood monocytes. These macrophages are really integral to HIV persistence. You can find them in fact in every organ of the body. And if you sequence the virus in those organs, they all have a common um, progenitor that's found in the blood. Additionally, these macrophages once infected are really challenging because they have evolved to have unique mechanisms that allow them to persist with the virus. So for instance, even though we have these great antiviral therapies, macrophages have found a way um, to efflux them out of our cells. So they have very low concentrations of these therapies, allowing them to have high amounts of virus, even when you're taking the therapies. They found ways to evade killing by CD8 T cells. So when they're infected by the HIV, we can't kill them. Furthermore, they've evolved to have ways where they can survive with the virus. So unlike CD4 T cells that die when they're infected, macrophages have survival pathways. They can then go on to uh, secrete virus that infects T cells. They can also produce inflammatory markers that activates these T cells that can make them into an activated infectious state rather than the quiescent state. So they're really, really problematic. Also, a number of these systemic inflammatory markers that I mentioned are produced directly by macrophages. And in fact, um, these antiviral therapies are not capable of suppressing macrophage inflammation while they can suppress that of T cells. And so this data are indicated here. We find that different inflammatory markers are produced earlier during infection, which you can see in the blue, green, and red. These are the earliest stages of acute HIV infection, and this is the chronic phase. And this is all in comparison to uninfected individuals in black. So you can see inflammatory markers are produced quite high and extensively early on. They're sustained chronically. And the challenge is, even after being infected and suppressed with ART for almost two years, you see that the trends of these inflammatory markers do not change. So they're produced very early, they're sustained chronically, and ART therapies can't suppress this. And this is because ART therapies are not designed to antagonize inflammation. And so you then have HIV affecting, infecting, and damaging virtually every organ system of the body. And we're going to talk to you today about how it impacts the brain. The brain is a major target for HIV, which is understudied, but it's quite interesting because you can find the virus in the brain within the first week of exposure. And in some studies, you can find it within the first four days of expected transmission. So this is incredibly fast before many people are even aware that they're infected by HIV. Unlike the periphery, the brain is quite unique. Infection in the brain is driven by myeloid cells like macrophages and microglia, and also astrocytes. And the brain is a viral reservoir where the virus can persist even when we're taking these suppressive therapies. And so it's a viral reservoir. And if we don't find a way to quell HIV in the brain and suppress it and eradicate it, we're never gonna be able to cure HIV. Because of this, people with HIV have many neurologic complications. My lab is particularly interested in cognition and mood disorders, but there are many others as well. Um, these cognitive impairments are termed HAND. It's a spectrum of cognitive impairments that range from asymptomatic impairment all the way up to dementia-like uh, 
and parents. These really, really dramatically impact your quality of life. And I'm listing just a few of the symptoms that occur here that make it really challenging. These impairments, in fact, up to 50% of people that live with HIV. So it's a large percent of individuals. And they're diagnosed by neuropsychologic and mental health testing. So you give a battery of neuropsychiatric tests to evaluate different cognitive domains like learning and memory. And so how do these myeloid cells contribute to this cognitive impairment? It's quite interesting. What's believed to occur is we have these monocytes that are um, in the blood, progibus can go into tissues, become macrophages, and if there's a pathogen, um, internalize it and help clear it. The challenge is these monocytes can be infected by HIV. So when they cross the blood barrier to get into the brain, they can bring that virus with them. That can then go on to infect resident CNS cells. Now, not every cell in the brain is gonna be infected. And in fact, most cells are uninfected, but they can see this virus and respond to it and they become activated. They produce a number of different inflammatory chemokines that help recruit additional cells into the brain. They produce inflammatory cytokines um, that produce a neuroinflammatory state. And they also produce host factors that attempt to help get rid of the virus, but they're in fact neurotoxic. And indeed, HIV is itself neurotoxic. Many of the viral proteins are directly damaging to neurons. And so the combination of this inflammatory state and this neurotoxic state leads to neuronal damage and loss. And depending on the brain region where you have this neuronal damage, you're gonna have a consequent loss of function. And so I've spent my career from graduate school, not of being independent faculty, looking at these myeloid cells. I'm going to talk to you about some studies uh, today looking at that. We're going to begin looking at these monocytes. And to do this, we've collected blood from people that have HIV, isolated out the peripheral blood immune cells, also looked at plasma for inflammatory markers. We've looked at our immune cells and phenotyped them by cytometry, and we've also added them to our individual model of the blood-brain barrier. We're focusing on monocytes specifically. There are two main markers used to look at these monocytes. CD14 is the LPS receptor, and CD16 is the FC gamma 3 receptor that helps respond to antibody. When you look at these two markers, you'll find that most monocytes in healthy people express CD14, but you have very few cells that express CD16. Um, you also know that there's heterogeneity in these cells that express CD16, where some have higher amounts of CD14 and others have lower. Interesting thing about these monocytes is that they're highly permissive to HIV. And indeed, they've been found to be present in the brain of those that have these kind of impairments or hand, and they're positive for viral antigens. So we suspect that they're the culprits bringing virus into the brain, but when I began my PhD, that hadn't yet been um, just studied definitively. And so I set out to look at this. I looked at the monocytes in people that were HIV negative and HIV positive, and found that indeed, when you have HIV, you have an increased number of these cells that have C16. Um, it's quite stark, and you can see uh, really how many of them you have compared to when you're uninfected. I'm showing one representative individual here, but you can see this happens for many people. So these data are looking at people who have HIV from two independent cohorts, um, the MAD HIV brain bank and the women's interagency HIV study. And you can see a large number of these cells compared to when you're uninfected. Um, but you will note that there's a large heterogeneity where some people have high amounts of these monocytes and others have much lower amounts. We then went on to look at these cells and how they migrated across our in vitro model of the human blood-brain barrier. This model consists of a tissue culture insert that has a filter with three micron pores. On the upper side of the filter, we add our primary human brain microvascular and endothelial cells. On the underside, we add human cortical astrocytes. And so these filters have three micron pores that allow the astrocytes to penetrate and make physical contact with the endothelial cells that help seal the barrier. We then add our immune cells to the top and they migrate to the bottom for 24 hours in response to the potent chemoattractant CCL2. When we do this, we can look at the cells before migration and after migration and analyze them for both CD14 and CD16. And when we do this, we can see that the cells that have CD16 preferentially migrate. They're highly enriched after migration compared to before migration whereas the other monocyte populations migrate to a much lower extent. This is again data from one representative individual, but you can see looking at almost 30 people, the 14, 16 monocytes in blue migrate to a high extent, both in basal conditions to media alone, as well in response to the chemotractant CCL2, whereas the others migrate to a much lower extent. 
we're really interested in seeing how these cells migrate, um, which is facilitated by a multi-step process where the cells have to adhere to the blood brain barrier, they bind tightly, they diabetes, and then they eventually migrate. We're focusing on this diabetes step because this is the commit step that's required to help them um, extravasate into the brain. And when we look at this closely, we see this occurs by interactions between the monocyte and the endothelial cells um, of key adhesion molecules um, that help separate them through in a well-controlled fashion. So we wanted to look at these adhesion molecules and see if they were required to help them migrate. We looked at four specifically, Alcam, GMA, PKM, and C99. Um, I'm going to show data of just one of them today with you, Alcam. We found that when you have HIV, these um, 14 to 16 monocyte type Alcam highly expressed on them. And in fact, when you're uninfected, you have very little to no presence of this Alcam molecule. And quite interestingly, it's required for the migration. So we can block Alcam interactions with um, a blocking antibody. And you can see that for, for the 14 to 16 monocyte specifically, you can inhibit migration to CCL2 when you have Alcam antibodies present. This migration is selective because when you add an um, irrelevant antibody to IgG1, migration is unaffected. So this is quite promising, and it shows that we have a potential therapeutic target to inhibit monocyte migration across the barrier. We then went on to look at these monocytes and wanted to see how they were associated with cognitive function. And we found that when you have higher levels of these 14, 16 monocytes that are also called intermediate cells, you have decreased cognition, looking at both um, processing speed, executive function, verbal learning, and fluency. We also looked at several markers of these monocytes um, and found pathways indicate um, inflammatory profiles and see how they were linked to cognition. And when we did this, we found three pathways, neuroinflammatory signaling, myeloid endothelial communication, and microglial immediate immune cell recruitment to the brain. And we saw if they were associated with decreased cognition in the areas of learning, memory, attention, executive function, processing speed, fluency, and motor skills. Um, and that each of these were predictive of long-term deficit in cognition over a 12-year period. So I think these cells are quite important in um, damaging the brain, promoting a neuroinflammatory environment that promotes cognitive dysfunction. So we've set out to find ways um, to limit this inflammation. We know that we can stop them from getting in by looking at Alcam, but we're trying to see if we can inhibit this profound tissue inflammation. And we're looking at the cannabinoid system as a means to do this. So cannabinoids um, have different categories. There are plant cannabinoids, most commonly thought of those in a cannabis plant, like THC, for instance. There are endocannabinoids that we produce endogenously. And there are synthetic cannabinoids, like uh, receptor agonists. And they bind different um, cannabinoid receptors, like CB1s or CB2. The interesting thing is that these cannabinoids are expressed everywhere in the body, and their jobs are to help us maintain homeostasis. We found that when you leverage these cannabinoid systems, you can reduce inflammation um, in a number of different instances, like cancer, viral infections, as well as neurodegenerative diseases. And so we're setting out to look at one in particular, CBD or cannabidiol. This is a really promising cannabinoid because it has no psychotropic effects, so you don't feel any kind of high or reward feelings, um, and it has really, really beneficial anti-inflammatory effects. It's also great because it's highly versatile. It's present in a variety of different um, states that will be really, really easy to take therapeutically. And because it's not psychotropic, it is not um, vulnerable to um, uh, DEA regulations. And so it's not a controlled substance at all. Additionally, there's already an FDA approved CBD drug in clinical use that's used to treat um, uh, epilepsy. And so if this works, we'll be able to have a therapy that's already existing that can be used for HIV. And so we're going to be using a macaque model to evaluate this. We're looking at recent macaques infected with SIV, or simian immunodeficiency virus. This model is quite robust. It's highly consistent because animals have an intact immune system, and it's the most widely used animal model to look at SIV in an intact immune deficient host. This model is fantastic because it mimics human disease, where you have high levels of infection as measured in both the plasma and in the cerebrospinal fluid. This virus is fantastic because it can also be suppressed with the therapies used to HIV in humans. And so you can find that after about uh, 90 days, you have a complete suppression below detectable limits and remain suppressed as long as these therapies are adhered to. 
this model mimics human disease as well because we could find plasma and markers of inflammation like CCL2 and cyber CD163 that are produced during infection and that are incapable of being suppressed with our art suppressive therapies. Further, we can find markers of inflammation, neopterin, and neuroinflammation, um, neurofilament light chain as an indicator of neuronal damage produced in the CSF that again are produced through HIV, but are not capable of being suppressed with art therapies. And so we can even look in the brain itself and find macrophages microglia that are activated and have markers like C163 that are highly present in SIV and both microglia and macrophages that are not, again, able to be suppressed by art therapies as evidenced by this uh, red and morphological changes. And so we can get macrophages out of both peripheral organs like spleen as determined by facts. We can get them out of the brain as well. You can see here very few populations of macrophages. And then we can um, perform transcriptomics to look at different inflammatory markers and antiviral markers involved in the interferon pathway that are, again, not fully suppressed when you have art therapies and are produced a comparable amount as animals that are infected. And so what do we hope to do? We wanna take these animals, infect them, suppress them with art for six months. We will have a group of animals that receive CBD and we will be um, taking hazard markers longitudinally, CSF longitudinally, and at terminal time points, harvesting grain and looking to see how these microbiotes are expressing different inflammatory markers and functional characteristics. Um, so we can get our macrophages, um, digest the solid um, organs, perform disintegrated isolation for the liquid organs like blood and uh, bronchial bronchioagular lavage, and as that microbiotes by CD11B positive cell selection. At the same time, we can also perform cognitive testing on our macaques. So we have a really powerful means to look at both the cellular mechanisms as well as the contributions to high order cognition. And so we hope that we'll be able to see if CBD can be an attractive therapy to suppress inflammation, help maintain cognition, and hopefully limit myeloid cells as mediators of inflammation during HIV. Because as again, right now we have no means to suppress inflammation and art therapies are not capable of inhibiting it. And so with that, I'd like to thank my lab who are incredible, outstanding, hardworking, um, and are a joy to be around. I have to thank my collaborators, our funding, and I'm really happy to, um, for your attention and to the questions um, if time permits. So I will end these slides if I can, and I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Williams, with such a great talk on HIV and cognitive impairment. Uh, now it will be some time for one or two questions as we are running out of time. But if I may ask, um, so this increase, this actually phenomenal increase in the CD16 positive, CD14 positive monocytes, uh, do we know what drives this? Is the virus driving this? Or is it like, for example, the virus is like, I don't know, uh, supporting the development of those cells somehow? Great question, yeah. So we found that, um, MCSF, which is a macrophage growth factor, is produced in the plasma to high levels acutely. Um, and that's a direct growth factor that helps these cells proliferate. Interestingly, it maintains to be produced even when you suppress the virus with art therapies. So we think it's the main factor, but we don't know who's making that MCSF. And it's mm -hmm. unclear why it continues to be produced when the virus is suppressed. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a question from Medina. Uh, she says, thank you for the really interesting talk. Uh, is this kind of macrophage inflammation associated with other neuroinflammatory conditions? It is. Um, they're culprits broadly in inflammation. Um, things like Alzheimer's, um, Parkinson's, other psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia, depression. Um, they're really, really globally involved. We're just beginning to fully understand what um, macrophage into the brain, these inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, they're culprits in all of these. Um, and so it's quite interesting and it's a burgeoning field. Okay. I think in the interest of time, we have to move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sandra Phillips. So Dr.
Dr. Phillips is a senior scientist in the liver immunology group at the Roger Williams Institute of Hepatology, where she leads the hepatitis B program. She also holds an adjunct lecturer position at King's College London. She moved to the UK in the year 2001 from France to take on a technician job in uh, Dr. Nikolai Naumov lab and worked on the immunopathogenesis of chronic hepatitis B virus infection. She was awarded her PhD in hepatology at University College London in 2011. During her postdoc years, she published several papers with Dr. Shilpa Shoksi on identifying new therapeutic targets and evaluating host-targeted therapies as a strategy to cure chronic, uh, chronic hepatitis B infection. She has recently expanded her field of research to liver cancer and hep hepatitis B virus and alcoholic-related liver disease comorbidities. Welcome, Dr. Phillips. Um, Thank you. Thank stage you is yours. Me. Thank you for um, the introduction. So I'll share my screen now. Um, Can you see the screen now? Okay. Perfect. Um, well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank um, the Black Immunology Organizers for their um, kind invitation. And uh, basically my talk uh, uh, today will be um, a focus about this uh, new project that actually we've started less than a year ago. So it's actually a, a very uh, new project. And um, it's about the evaluation of osteopontin as an immunotherapeutic target for hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. And so most of my work so far has been focused on chronic hepatitis B um, infection, uh, which has been uh, declared by the WHO as a um, threat for public health. And, and this is because the statistics with uh, HPV infection are actually uh, staggering. Um, there are 2 billion uh, people uh, who uh, are infected with this virus and uh, exhibiting serological evidence of uh, past occurrence infections. And among those, between 257 and 300 millions are chronically infected. And unfortunately, many of those infections uh, remained undiagnosed. Moreover, uh, HBV uh, causes 1.5 million new infections uh, every year. And while the prevalence of this infection is in decline in younger population, the mor morbidity associated with uh, this chronic infection remains extremely high. Uh, this virus kills every 30 seconds. Um, and this is because HBV is a potent oncogenic virus. Uh, it is in fact the second most important carcinogen after tobacco. And chronic infection with HBV increases the risk of dying from liver cancer by 100 folds. Moreover, globally, HBV is the most common risk factor of uh, HCC, accounting for about 50%. Other etiologies, such as alcohol, high-fat diet, and other viruses account for the remaining uh, 50%. And so um, HBV uh, or chronic HBV infection um, contribute, majorly contribute to ranking um, HCC as the fourth leading cause of cancer-related death. And um, this primary liver cancer incidence is actually on the rise because of the contribution of many of those different etiologies. And like for other uh, cancer, targeting the tumor microenvironment has recently emerged as a very promising therapeutic strategies for HCC, and that include a checkpoint inhibitors. And for example, for unresectable, uh, advanced HCC, the first line of therapy is a combination of anti pdl one and anti-VGF, which has an overall response rate of 27%. So we need to find a better, a more efficacious uh, strategies to improve this uh, response uh, rate. And so at the Institute, basically the aim of our research program is to dissect the immune, but also molecular 
uh, mechanisms that are involved in, in chronic HPV infection and uh, liver disease, uh, including uh, HCC. And, uh, but the ultimate goal is actually to identify immunomodulatory, but also host targeted uh, therapies uh, for those diseases. And for this, we need the support of um, experimental uh, models and some of well, one of those models I'm going to talk about later uh, in this talk. But for today, I'm going to be focusing, as I said, on this host protein osteopontin and its role in the regulation of the immune response to HCC. So osteopontin is a phosphoprotein, a glycoprotein, which is secreted. Um, we only started now to understand its role in the pathogenesis of chronic liver disease. Um, it has been first identified as a pro-fibrogenic uh, factor. And more recently, it's been applicated in HCC proliferation, uh, metastasis, but also uh, immune escape. But we still do not fully understand how osteopontin does regulate the, the um, response um, to HCC. And moreover, uh, the evaluation of osteopontin as a therapeutic target has never been um, uh, looked into. And so this is the aims of our uh, studies. So when we measure um, OPN in the plasma of uh, patients with chronic liver disease, we observe an increase, as you can see here, with the severity of, of, of the disease. Um, it's more produced in HCC patients compared to chronic HPV patients. And uh, within the HCC, there is also a, a etiology dependency, uh, whereby non-vowel HCC, so HCC driven by um, in this case, fat and alcohol produce more plasma OPN than HBV-driven uh, HCC. And using a publicly available uh, databases, we try to correlate um, the expression of OPN uh, with uh, patients' overall survivals and found that high levels of OPN is associated, as you can see, with poor uh, survival. Also with this particular data set, we were able to determine uh, OPN cutoff points that can uh, discriminate uh, uh, between patients with poor and, and, and better uh, probability of uh, survivals. Also, uh, we interrogated uh, more databases to determine the expression of uh, osteopontin within the tumors. Uh, Deep according to the etiologies. And as you can see, we found that OPN was more expressed in the tumor compared to the non-tumor adjacent uh, region. And I'm showing you the data from the uh, NASH uh, HCC, so non-vowel HCC. But we also found uh, the same trend in the HBV-induced HCC. And in this particular database, uh, we um, determine um, or we measure rather right, OPN expression at various distances from the center of the tumor. You can see those different regions here. And what we found is that OPN was more expressed um, in the center of the tumor, but its expression did decline in regions that are further away from the center of the tumor. So altogether, those data seem to suggest that OPN is implicated in HCC, but we need to understand how. And so what we did, um, we um, basically treated PBMCs from healthy controls, chronic HBV HCC, non-vowel HCC with a mix of tumor associated antigens, but also for the HBV HCC, we also stimulated PBMCs with HBV antigens. And to try to restore an anti-tumor and also anti-vowel uh, um, T cell response, we also uh, added a PD-1 monoclonal antibody. And we assess the functions of those T cells uh, by uh, performing an interferon gamma and enzyme B uh, early spot. And so uh, maybe for those who don't know about the early spot, so it's a bit like an ELISA. And then when you have a, um, a T cell response, you have those spots. And basically, one spot represents one interferon gamma or enzyme B producing T cells. And then we try to correlate this uh, T cell response with OPN production, and this by measuring OPN in the cell culture uh, supernatants. 
And so when uh, we uh, stimulated PBMCs from healthy controls with the TAA and anti-PD-1, uh, we did not uh, see any uh, increase in the number of interferon gamma or Gonzan B uh, um, T cells, and there was no significant change in the uh, uh, OPN production. In the HBV, uh, uh, HCC cohort, um, the uh, combinatorial treatment, as you can see, did not induce any significant uh, changes. Uh, you can see that it's quite of a mixed bag of a uh, uh, response. So no changes in the uh, anti-tumor, but also the antiviral response. However, we did observe a, a, a slight a minimal loss of OPN, uh, uh, about uh, 10%. Um, in the non-vowel cohort, however, we did observe uh, an induction of, uh, of T-cell response, an increase in interferon gamma and enzyme B producing um, T-cells. And this was accompanied by a significant, for about 48% loss of osteoprotein. Moreover, in those non-vowel HCC, those two parameters were negatively correlated, but we did not find any correlations in the healthy control or the HBV HCC. And so, so far, those data seem to suggest that OPN does suppress uh, the anti-tumor uh, uh, T-cell response. So what would happen if you were to uh, block OPN, if you were to target uh, OPN? So to answer this question, we uh, took PBMCs from uh, HBV HCC, non-vowel HCC, again stimulated with uh, TAA and from the HBV HCC with the HBV antigens. And we added work combinant OPN to try to see if we could further inhibit the anti-tumor and antiviral response. And then we also block OPN with an uh, naptamer and uh, we use a sham aptamer as a negative controls. And then we perform some uh, fax analysis. And so when we added work combinant OPN, we kind of expected that there was no uh, um, further inhibition because um, those T cells are already profoundly uh, uh, impaired. Uh, I'm going to show you the interferon gamma CD80 cell response, which are the basically effector uh, um, uh, cell subsets. And uh, in the chronic HBV HCC patients, blocking OPN actually did not uh, change uh, the uh, interferon gamma uh, anti-tumor CD8 T cell response. However, it did induce interferon gamma HBV specific CD8 T cell response, so the antiviral response. In the non-vowel HCC, blockade of OPN induced an interferon gamma anti-tumor CD8 um, T cell uh, response. But the data I have shown uh, so far are uh, from the periphery because we've, we've used PBMCs, but we need to know what happens to the tumor infiltrated lymphocytes because to see if they can perform anti-tumor effector function. But for that, we need uh, immunocompetent models of uh, HCC. And unfortunately, the, the available models are not immunocompetent. So we developed the precision cut tumor slices that contain a resident uh, immune cells. Um, so this is the workflow of how we produce the tumor slices. So we get patients recruited weekly from the surgical team. Those patients undergo surgical uh, for tissue resection because of primary liver cancer. And because we are next to the hospital, we can get hold of the specimen very quickly. Um, we will get to flush the specimen, so get the perfusate from which we can isolate uh, um, immune cells. And we perform those core, as you can see here, and then slice them into five millimeter diameter and 250 micro thickness uh, disc or slices. And those slices are the exact match to the original tumor. Uh, they do contain all the different cell types, also the resident immune cells, the extracellular matrix is also present. And we can culture those slices for up to 15 days and do a number of studies with those slices. I just have to say that we were awarded by ESL um, a basic science school where that we hosted actually last September to teach how to produce a those precision cut tumor or liver slices on, and also liver organoids. And so I'm going to show you the data from one patient's non-vowel HCC. We produce the tumor slices 
tweeted them for three days because this was our first experiment with a sham and also the Nopian aptomer. And so the HNE staining didn't show any, any changes. However, when we assess for uh, cell death uh, by performing a, a tunnel assay, we could see an increase in the number of uh, tumor um, that were killed just three days after blocking uh, OPN. And you can see this more clearly in the uh, numerical representation. And this was also further confirmed uh, by measuring LDH that are released by, um, by the, the cells that were killed. Um, now, what we have to do is to determine if this cell killing is actually mediated by an activation of the anti-tumor uh, response. And this is what we're going to do uh, next. So I'm going to summarize um, what we've shown so far is that OPN does contribute to the immunosuppressive environment in HCC, that the disruption of OPN activity with anti-PD-1 and OPN blockade does restore HCC T cell immunity, but only in the non-viral HCC. And this reveals an etiological dependency. Um, moreover, OPN blockade can induce tumor cell killing, and we are further investigating OPN as an immunotherapeutic target for HCC. So briefly, what we uh, what we are going or planning to do, um, we um, actually have done that already. We have produced uh, precision cut tumor slices from one HBV HCC and non vowel HCC and a treated with OPN aptomer alone or in combination with an anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, and nivolumab actually. Uh, and this is based on the preliminary data that I've shown, uh, show you, and we will assess the activation of the immune response in the slices. Also, we are the global lead for uh, the immunosurveillance of nivolumab uh, as a treatment for HCC. This was in collaboration with BMS, uh, the Checkmate 040 trial. And we've collected for the last 10 years more than um, 5,000 samples. And what we're going to do is basically uh, select a, um, a short, a small cohort of patients who receive nivolumab as a first line um, a therapy. Um, we're going to um, actually select non-responders, so patients who did not respond to nivolumab, and uh, treat of, um, the PBMCs with an OPN aptomer to see if we can kind of restore uh, the anti-tumor uh, response. Um, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to, well, thanks the, the team, especially uh, Sherpa Chokshi, um, who's the, the head of the group, um, and uh, also all of our collaborators, of course, the patients for consenting, and, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Phillips, for such a fantastic and great talk. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions and until they come through, if I may ask, uh, do, you, do we know or do you intend of looking at, for example, if osteopontine um, works on Tregs, like uh, enhancing their suppressive capacity or like making them more, more suppressive? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't think anybody actually looked at that, um, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if they did activate Tregs um, to, well, because they do part, OPN participate to the uh, immunosuppressive environment uh, in the tumor. So I wouldn't be surprised if it does so. But we hopefully when we, we get to do um, the flow cytometry with the PBMCs, um, we, we will put some Tregs marker in there as well. Yeah, that would be great. That would be pleasing to me to, at least. <laughs> So uh, we have a question from David Schatz, uh, who said, thank you, Dr. Phillips, for a very interesting talk. What fraction of HCC is non-viral? Uh, well, it depends of where, which part of the world you're looking at. Um, so in the Western world, uh, it's mostly uh, ethanol and um, non-alcoholic steatoid hepatitis um, because of what they call the Western diet. And, um, and uh, alcohol abuse. Um, in um, Asia, it's more uh, HBV, HBV driven. Um, so depending where you look. 
Okay, and he is also asking uh, why does OPN seem to play a less of an important role in viral HCC? Well, that's a question we, we're trying to, to answer. Um, I think that the HBV, HCC, um, so, I mean, in the field, everybody is try, is um, actually um, t what, saying that HCC or trying to um, looking at HCC the same way. But we know that etiology play a great role. So there would be differences in uh, HCC according to the etiology. And we've seen that in some of our unpublished data whereby the HBV HCC actually are the ones that behave very differently from the other etiologies. And that's even include hepatitis C driven HCC. I think because maybe this virus does integrate itself into the host genome, it has high oncogenic capacity and maybe that integration is responsible for the difference that we see. Um, they are very more difficult to treat uh, in general and maybe that is one of, of the reason. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. And thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. Thank you. So we go now to our next speaker of the session, uh, which is Dr. Joy Nakawisi. So Joy Nakawisi started her career with a master's in molecular biology from Lund University in Sweden. She went on and obtained her PhD in immunology at Lund University in 2021. During her PhD, Joy studied the mechanisms involved in the induction of adaptive immune responses during rotavirus infection. Joy is currently a postdoctoral research associate at the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial College London, UK, where she is studying the mechanisms involved in the generation of lung resident memory T cells, specifically CD8 positive T cells during respiratory viral infections. So welcome, Dr. Nakwisi. Thank you so much, Yasin, for that kind introduction. And um, can everyone see my slides? I would think so. And yeah, so, and thank you to the organizing committee for this great opportunity. And I'm going to talk to you about the role of type one interference and MAP signaling in the generation of tissue resident memory CD8 positive T cells during RSV infection. Oh, good. Um, yeah. yeah, so respiratory essential virus or RSV, it is a single-stranded RNA virus and it's still one of the major causes of lower respiratory tract infections. And in humans, the virus still causes approximately about 33 million new cases each year in children under five years of age. And the virus still causes severe disease in the elderly and the immunocompromised persons. And sadly, due to the lack of proper memory responses generated and also the lack of an effective available vaccine, RSV uh, reinfection. Sorry, Dr. Anakasi. Um, mm. See, we cannot see your slides. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Let me try sharing again. Sorry about that. Share screen. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Banis, can you confirm this? Yes, we oh, can see okay. that. Okay. Okay. So yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so I'll just pick up from where I ended that RSV reinfections still occur throughout one's life due to the lack of effective vaccines. And when we try to summarize the immune responses that are generated during the primary RSV infection, we have we have the innate immunity and studies from our laboratory have shown that alveolar macrophages are the main producers of type 1 interference that are secreted early during the primary immune response. And these lead to the recruitment of different immune cells into the lungs and the airways, but also influence the induction of the adaptive immune response. And 
Yeah, as you can see, um, the induction of the adaptive immune response also directly coincides with the viral clearance of the virus from the lungs. And yeah, so when we zoom into the CD8 T cell responses that are activated following the primary infection, we can see that RSV-specific CD8 T cells uh, expand and they peak between days 8 and 10 post-primary infection. These undergo a contraction phase, but they also form a stable memory pool after the primary infection. And based on the phenotype and their circulatory characteristics, CD8 memory cells can be divided into the central memory cells and the effector memory cells and these ones are known to circulate between blood and the secondary lymphoid organs but we also have the lung re resident T cells that are mainly resident in the secondary lymphoid organs these ones do not circulate and they are the focus of my talk today yeah so complementary to antibodies the tissue resident memory T cells in the lungs have been increasingly appreciated as key components of protective responses in the lungs. And with these CD8 tissue resident memory cells, which I will refer to from now on as TREM cells, have been shown to play a central role in protecting from reinfection by respiratory viruses in both humans and mice. And these cells can be identified by their co-expression of different surface markers like the CD69 and the CD103, as shown in the fax plot here. But also in the lungs, these cells additionally expressed CD49A and the CXCR6. Now, it's common knowledge that CD8 TREM cells are poorly maintained in the lungs compared to other mucosal organs and also the requirements or mechanisms that are involved in their generation and maintenance in the lungs are still poorly defined. So in this study, we mainly focused to aim to investigate this in more details. And to do this, we know that after any primary infection, TREM cells seed the lungs where they are maintained locally at low numbers so that they can rapidly react to a reinfection. So to test the dynamics of this response during RSV infection, we intranasally infected black six mice with the RSV. These mice were reinfected after three weeks. And then the lungs and the bronchioalveolar lavage were collected on days one, two, three, and four post reinfection. And we analyzed the classically defined CD8 TREM cells. So we observed a remarkable expansion of CD8 TREM cells, both in the lungs and in the airways on day four post reinfection. And these results are also quantified here, showing that during RSV reinfection, CD8 TREM cells expand between days three and four post reinfection. So we also further went ahead and looked at the further time points post reinfection or how long these cells can be maintained or still be detected in the lungs. And if we first look at the open or white circles here, these mice were not reinfected, but we can still see and now this point is almost seven weeks post primary infection. No, this is five weeks post primary infection. And then this point is seven weeks post primary infection. We can see that these cells are maintained, although at low levels, both in the lungs and in the airways. And when we come in with a reinfection or secondary infection, we can clearly see in the black circles that these cells rapidly expand on day four post reinfection, but then they reduce slightly, but then these, they then gain a new baseline, which is higher compared to the baseline that is, made, that is created on the primary infection. So also these ones are maintained steadily up to, this is two weeks post reinfection, and this is one month post reinfection, showing that these cells can be still be maintained and detected in both the lungs and in the airways, at least up to 28 days post reinfection. 
So the next thing we wanted to look at is that we know that these T-REM cells are mainly characterized by their ability to reside within the lungs and not to recirculate. So we also next wanted to confirm whether this expansion that we are seeing on day for post reinfection that it was mainly due to T-cell tissue resident memory T cell proliferation within the lungs with no contribution from the recirculatory T cells. And to do this, after the primary infection, so before we came in, a few days before we came in with a secondary infection and also after reinfection, the mice were treated with a FTY720, which is a sphingosine one phosphate receptor down regulator, which blocks the cell egress from the lymph nodes. So this means that all cell, all cells that are activated in the lung draining lymph nodes are not able to make it back to the lungs during a respiratory infection but to also further help us distinguish between the cells that were truly resident in the lungs from cells that will that might be present in the lung vasculature but they may end up in our lung suspension so we inject intravenously injected the mice with the buv395 conjugated anti-cd45 antibody 10 minutes before these mice were euthanized. And at this early time point ensures that all cells that are present in circulation will be labeled with this anti-CD45 antibody. So yeah, we still analyze the C CD8 TREM population. And we could see clearly based on our anti-CD45 staining, we could see that our CD8 TREM cells did not stain for the CD45 apart from the few that, were, that we could pick up in the blood. But also interestingly, we noted that despite blocking T cell egress from the FTY treated mice, we also observed that the T-REM cells in the FTY treated mice expanded at the same extent as the T-REM cells in the vehicle treated mice. And these results are also quantified here, clearly showing that this T-REM expansion is mainly in the cells that are resident in the lungs and not a lot is coming in from the recirculatory T cells also further confirming that CD8 T REM cell expansion after RSV reinfection is sustained independently of the circulatory T cells. So moving on, we know that the innate immunity that is very important to control virus infection, but also to induce the adaptive immune response is initiated when pathogens are detected or sensed via pattern recognition receptors. And RSV can be detected via endosomal pattern recognition receptors like TOR receptor 3 and the TOR like receptor 7, which signal via the TRIF and the MYMYD88 adapter proteins, respectively. RSV can also be sensed by the cytosolic pattern recognition receptors like the RIG-I or the MDA5, which both converge via the mitochondrial antiviral protein or the MAVs. And signaling via these adapter proteins induces the expression of type 1 interference and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. So the next thing we investigated was the contribution of pattern recognition receptor signaling to the CD8 T REM cell response that is generated during RSV infection by using both the MYD8 8 TRIF double knockout mice and the MAVS knockout mice. So before we reinfected, we first assessed the baseline T REM cells that are present after primary infection and with this wild type MAVS knockout and the MYD8 8 TRIF double knockout mice were intravenously infected with RSV. And then at 21 days, we analyzed the CD8 T REM cell population, and we could see clearly, of course, these are the PBS mice that were not infected, but we could see three weeks after the primary infection. In both our different mouse groups, we have a proper established CD8 T REM cell population. Although in the MAVS knockout mice, we noticed that the CD8 T REM cell numbers were significantly reduced compared to the T-REM cells in the wild type mice. So we went ahead and reinfected these mice after 21 days. And on day four post-reinfection, 
we analyze the CD8 T-REM cells, and we notice that if we first look at the wild type groups, so this group was not reinfected, but we could see that upon reinfection, these T-REM cells clearly expand after four days. However, the CD8 T-REM cells were significantly reduced in the MAVS knockout and the MYD8 h double knockout mice, indicating that the absence of pattern recognition receptor signaling reduces the CD8 T-REM cells that are generated during RSV reinfection. So one of the effector functions of these CD8 T-REM cells is their production of granzyme B and the interferon gamma. So the next thing we also focused on the functionality of the cell, of the T-REM cells generated in these knockout mice. And to do this on death for post reinfection cells from the lungs were re-stimulated ex vivo using the RSV peptide and assessed their intracellular granzyme B and interferon gamma. And we noticed that in addition to the reduced T-REM cell numbers, we found that the MAVS knockout mice, but not the MYD8H3 double knockout mice, had significantly reduced both granzyme B and the interferon gamma producing CD8 T-REM cells, indicating that MAVS signaling is required to generate functional CD8 T-REM cells, while the MYD8H3 double knockout signaling is dispensable. So to quickly summarize of this part, we showed that during RSV reinfection, CD8 T-REM cells expand in both the lungs and the airways after four days. We also showed that these cells can still be detected 28 days later. Uh, this We have also showed that this expansion is sustained independently of recruitment of recirculatory T-cells. We also found that MAVs, both the MAVs and the MYD8 h signaling are necessary for T-REM cell expansion. However, only MAVs signaling was necessary for the CD8 T-REM cell functionality. So we further investigated what was going on in these MAVs knockout mice. Um, we know from previous studies in the lab that MAVs knockout mice or that the type 1 interferon production that is early on in the primary infection is dependent on MAVS signaling. As you can see in the open squares dotted lines that the MAVS knockout mice are not able to produce any type 1 interferons compared to the wild type mice during the RSV primary RSV infection. We also know that this phenotype in the MAVS knockout mice can be partially rescued when these mice are given recombinant interferon alpha. So we reason that this early interferon response could, could affect or influence the generation of a subsequent memory response. And to test this hypothesis, um, after primary infection of the MAVS knockout mice, some of the mice, MAVS knockout mice were treated with two doses of recombinant interferon alpha at six hours and 18 hours post-primary infection. And then three weeks later, the mice were reinfected and then taken down after four days. And indeed, we found that the MAVS CD8 T-REM cell expansion was restored in the MAVS knockout mice that received recombinant interferon alpha. However, CD8 T-REM cell functionality remained impaired in these mice based on the CD granzyme B and interferon gamma producing T-REM cells. Also clearly showing that distinct MAVS signaling mechanisms are involved in CD8 T-REM cell expansion and functionality. And to also quickly summarize of this last part, we were also able to show that during RSV reinfection, CD8 T-REM cell expansion in the MAVS knockout mice is dependent on the type 1 interference during the early phase of the primary infection. However, the CD8 T-REM cell functionality is independent of the initial type 1 interferon response, thus revealing a dual role of MAVS signaling for, for T-REM cell reactivation. And with this, I would like to acknowledge my wonderful supervisor, Professor Cecilia Johansson, and all members in the Johansson lab. I would also like to acknowledge previous members in the lab, especially Augusto, who greatly contributed to this work. I'd like to acknowledge all our funders. And yeah, thank you all.
police again and i'll stop sharing now okay thank you very much dr nakawisi that was really a great talk so we have some questions here so uh irina is asking if the lung resident memory cd8 t cells uh within the bolt are they are they within the bolt structures or are they diffuse within the so we we have analyzed cells within the belt or the airways and also cells that are in the lungs so they are found both in both in both structures if i get if i get what you're meaning irene yeah mm. yeah i think so i also have a question so um the knockout of mavs um or the knockout of my D88 trip. Does that also, or does that suggest that the deficiency of the signaling is affecting? I'm trying to think. About the do um, do we need? Uh, I mean, what is the? What are the cells that are affected with this knockout? Is there like a certain type of DCs that is priming the? the CD8 T cells that are, when they lack the MAV signaling, they can't, for example, produce type 1 interferon and they cannot, for example, present antigen. Is that what you, what we're thinking? Is um, that I think that that's a very nice question. But what we, when we look at the CD8 response, total CD8 activated during primary infection, we see that both these knockout mice, the MAVs and the MYD8 atrif double knockout, produce similar levels of both CD8 and CD4. They mm -hmm. have, of, apart from the MAVs knockout that are deficient in the recruitment of like the neutrophils and the monocytes early on during the infection, but otherwise when you look at the T cell response, after the primary infection, it's similar. They have the mm -hmm. same RSV-specific CD8 and CD40 cells, but then the defect is intrinsically in the, in the generation of the tissue resident cells then. That's mm -hmm. when we start seeing the, the differences, but otherwise in the initial immune response, so that means that the dendritic cells are still okay in both. Yeah in, in both models, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, one last question is from Medina. So since RSV infection does not induce strong immunity, do we know what role CD8 positive memory T cells have in immunity or pathology against RSV? Um, what I know is that I know that studies, their colleagues here at Imperial College who have done studies RSV studies in human human volunteers, and they found that people mm -hmm. with a more or proper RSV specific TRM cells were more protected, or they had lower or reduced disease severity. But then, since we cannot rule out the role of the antibodies during both mm -hmm. the reinfection, we it's it's hard to tell but also adoptive transfer transfer experiments in the mice that lack antibodies or b cells have shown that when you give mice adoptively transfer the cd rsv specific cd8 trm cells these mice are better protected but um, with this with the pathology there is a contribution of antibodies too so which we cannot really rule out but mm -hmm. in RSV, but that would be more more clear when it comes to influenza, like when we use different influenza species, like either influenza, the PR8 or X31, where the antibodies now do not come in. But with RSV, yeah, we can't really differentiate or specifically tell the role of CD8 memory from the antibodies because they also play a big role. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakakwisi. Thank, Thank you very you much. So our next speaker of this session is Rafael Tiburicio. 
So Rafael earned his Bachelor of Biological Sciences at the Federal University of Bahia in 2017 and his PhD this year. Uh, in his thesis work, Rafael explore, explored the role of T lymphocytes in the immunopathogenesis of the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome related to tuberculosis HIV co-infection. Rafael is interested in high dimensional immune profiling and single cell RNA sequencing in the context of infectious diseases. Apart from being a T cell biology enthusiast, he loves watching and practicing sports. So welcome, Rafael. So it's the uh, stage yours. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And I wholeheartedly appreciate uh, uh, the kind of opportunity to share a bit of my work with you all this evening. So it is well established that human they exhibit a very wide range of immune responses against mycobacteria infection. And despite being a major health uh, burden, uh, hey, only a fraction of infected individuals will ever progress uh, to active diseases during the course of their lives. And as uh, immunity against mycobacteria infection occurs in a CD4 T cell dependent manner, uh, HIV infection considerably tips the balance towards uh, the mitigation of host protective responses. And as HIV-1 infection progresses, there is a great mitigation of immune responses against the bacteria and the risk of uh, TB reactivation, along with a hyperimmune activation and systemic inflammation. However, uh, uh, the antiretroviral treatment uh, represented a great acquisition because it reduces immortality associated with HIV infection and the risk of uh, developing opportunistic infections. However, in a fraction of TB HIV co-infected individuals uh, during the, the Initiation of art, uh, this, these patients can uh, develop immune reconstitution syndrome, which happens when they start the anti TB treatment. They experience a clinical improvement, but however, uh, shortly after the initiation of art, they experience a clinical deterioration, which is characterized by a massive uh, production of cytokine and inflammation levels. Risk factors associated with the uh, iris is. Uh, is very diverse and includes low CD4 T cell counts prior to uh, treatment initiation, uh, high viral load, as well as efficient response into uh, art, a shortage of all between these two types of treatment and genetic factors, as well as the age of the host. Mechanistically speaking, uh, this uh, to be iris occurs because in immune competent patient, uh, people, uh, CD4 T cells, they provide a signal that is uh, I apologize for that. CD4 T cells that provide a signal that fully activates macrophages. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, macrophage activation uh, that fully uh, eliminates the pathogen. However, in immunocompromised patients, uh, uh, bacteria, uh, macrophages are only partially uh, activated. So it allows for the accumulation of primate macrophages and bacterial replication. However, during art mediated uh, CD4 T cell recovery, there is the release of interferon gamma uh, signal, which now activate the macrophages and produce a, a massive amounts of. Uh, cytokines and collateral damage. So our hypothesis was that a hyperactivation of T lymphocytes contribute to development of TB iris. So we recruited uh, patients from the pulmonary hospital in Chennai, India. Uh, and these patients, just let me draw your attention to this, they were uh, highly immune suppressed as the CD4 T cells counts were lower than 100 cells per microliter. They were diagnosed with TB via the smear culture and the TB R determination was uh, done, performed by uh, three different physicians. So blood was collected from the pre-art stage and two to six weeks after art initiation, there is the time where uh, TB iris uh, occurs. 
So uh, the blood was uh, collected and cellular mediated was quantified by Luminex and the peripheral lymphocytes were immune phenotyped by uh, FAX. So what we can see is that uh, the TBRs patients, they have a, a lower uh, frequency of CD4 T cell uh, percentage before and after the initiation of treatment when compared to the TBRs counterparts. Uh, and this result is opposite when we are analyzing the CD T cell uh, frequencies where to be uh, what TBR is patients they display higher percentage of this type of cells and as well as a lower CD4 CD8 uh, ratio. When we dissect the activation landscape of these lymphocytes, what we can see is that TBR is patients they display higher uh, activation markers such as HLADR in the CD4 T cell compartment, lower uh, expression of uh, exhaustion markers such as PG1 when compared to the non TBI patient, and higher markers of proliferation and cytotoxicity as well. But just let me draw your attention to this point here where these patients they display higher levels of CD8 T cells expressing granzyme B before and after the initiation of treatment. Then we try to establish a network analysis to see how this population of cells are correlated before and after the initiation of treatment in both uh, groups. So what we can see from here is, uh, is that uh, this, as the total number of CD4 T cells, they are negatively correlated with uh, several uh, populations in, before the initiation of iris in both treat in both patients, but just let me draw your attention that this total number of CD4 T cells, they are negatively correlated with CD8 T cells expressing granzyme B, which can be a compensatory uh, mechanism uh, in face of a severe lymphopenia. And as a matter of fact, uh, these patients that develop TBIs, they have a higher interactome network density before and after the initiative of treatment and this granzyme B CD, express CD, granzyme B uh, was uh, the node or the, the population that established higher uh, number of connections. Later, we tried to correlate it, these populations with uh, different soluble mediators. So I also would like to draw your attention to this point where a TB iris patient, both before and after the treatment, uh, granzyme B, uh, uh, CD T cells, they uh, exhibit correlations with several cytokines such as IL-4, IL-10, and IL-17, which can be perceived as anti-inflammatory. So we also reasoned that this could be a compensatory mechanism in face of severe, uh, in a severe inflammation. Later, uh, we try to dissect the memory compartment of the CD8 T cells. They are playing a role in TBI's development. So we analyzed the frequency of uh, antigen experience CD8 T cells. And by antigen experience, I refer to uh, any population there are no naive T cells. So what we can see from here is that patients that develop TBI's, they have a higher frequency of antigen experience T cell CD8 T cells uh, after the initiation of the treatment. And this was the opposite when we are analyzing the naive population. And we established uh, correlations between uh, these, the frequency or the, the, the percentage of this population of CD8 T cell with several clinical parameters. And we can see from here is that in people that develop to be iris, the percentage of these cells are positive correlated with uh, the bacilli load. Uh, before the initiation of the treatment. Then we also tried to dissect the memory landscape uh, both before and after our initiation. And we can see from here from our hierarchical clustering uh, that in the time point one, which is uh, after a treatment initiation, we have a better separation of these two patients group and a higher percentage of effector memory cells in this cluster they are mainly composed by TBIs patients uh, in opposition to uh, the central memory cells. They are enriched in this cluster. They are mainly composed by non-TBIs uh, patients. Then later, we try to 
these scatter plots, they summarize the previous uh, results where we can see the time point one uh, naive T cells are higher in the non TBIs patients and effect remainder cells are higher for these TBIs patients. And we try also to correlate these uh, populations with uh, cells expressing different markers of uh, activation. So just let me uh, stress or highlight this, uh, that in DTBI patients, uh, CD naive T cells they displayed negative correlations with uh, several uh, activated uh, populations, such as granzyme B CD T cells and uh, activated uh, CD4 T cells. Then uh, we, we also try to analyze the reconstitution or the magnitude of reconstitution of each uh, CD8 population. And what we can see from here is that uh, non TBI iris patients, they have a higher expansion of uh, naive CD8 T cells, but we did not find any significant uh, expansion for the other memory compartment. Uh, so with this in mind, we reckon uh, what was driving this higher ex expansion of na naive CD8 T cells in non iris patients, and then we correlated the frequency, uh, the difference in the frequency of these populations with several uh, pre-art levels of as, uh, inflammatory cytokines. And what we can see here is that the magnitude of reconstitution of naive CD8 T cells are negative correlated with markers of innate immune cells activation, such as soluble tissue factor, while in TBI patients, the reconstitution of effector memory cells are correlated positively with several markers of innate activation, such as soluble CD163. Uh, and then just let me uh, remind you that the reconstitution of uh, T cell uh, populations in during HIV infection after the initiation of treatment occurring in two main phases. The first one, which is characterized by the release of the memory cells for inflamed, inflamed uh, lymph nodes, and the second one, which is the de novo reconstitution of these populations. So we analyzed the frequency of TD T cells that were expressing CXCR3, which is a marker of cells that choose exit the these inflamed lymph nodes. So what we can see here is that patients that did not develop TBIs, they have higher frequency of the total population of CD8 T cells expressing this marker, both before and after treatment initiation, uh, as well as central memory cells expressing this chymokine receptor and the naive population. And what we can see from here is that when we uh, develop our um, multi logistical re regression model, we can see that these populations and the baseline are a, uh, in naive population uh, less associated with the risk of developing iris, while the factory memory cells expressing the chym this chymokine receptor is uh, related or associated with a higher risk of uh, developed to be iris. And these results were also true when we analyze the frequency of the population after treatment initiation and we also uh, applied rock curve analysis to distinguish these patients both and baseline is depicted by this bluish line and time point one uh, represented by these uh, greenish lines. And what we can see from here is that uh, the total frequency of CDT cells expressing CXCR3 can uh, distinguish both these patients, both uh, at baseline and time point one. Central memory cells, they can distinguish at time point one and naive T cells, they can distinguish at both time points. So as a take home message, I would like to, to highlight that lymphocyte hyperactivation can be uh, seen as a pathological hallmark of TBIs that these patients, they display a distinct profile of memory CD8 T cell reconstitution after treatment initiation, and that there is a difference association between the frequency of these uh, CD8 T cells expressing CXCR3 and the risk of TBI's development. And also would like to thank for uh, the several people that were involved in this project from my lab here in Brazil, my supervisor, Dr. Bruno Drag, my uh, lab mates, Mariana, and Beatriz and Artur, 
Dr. Rini Serretti for the collaboration and Dr. Kapulin. Thank you very much for your attention as well. And I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much, Rafael. That was really interesting. It was really great talk. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. So let's see if we have uh, any questions coming through. Um, have you correlate? Uh, I mean, if I may start, have you correlated the percentage of naive? I it might be stupid, but percentage of naive CD4 positive cells and TB iris, and see if that can be used as a marker. I think it might be difficult, right? Yes, uh, one of my lab mates were doing his study in this question. So he uh, he analyzed the frequency of CD4 T cells and as well as the memory uh, compartment in this same scenario and same settings. And yes, it's also correlated with a higher risk of developed TBIs. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, okay, um, I don't see any more questions and I guess also we are short on time. So thank you, Raphael. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For presentation. So our last presentation of the day, our last speaker would be uh, Dr. Oyobola Oyesola. So Dr. Oyobola Oyesola earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Univers University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Motivated by her interest to better understand diseases of global and zoonotic importance, Bola started her postgraduate training in infection and immunity at the University of Leicester here in the UK. She consequently returned to Nigeria to join the African Center for Excellence for Genomics and of Infectious Diseases under the mentorship of Professor Christian Happy. Dr. Oisola went on to start a doctoral program in immunology and infectious disease at Cornell University and is currently a visiting postdoctoral fellow in the Loki lab at the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases in the NIH, where she investigates uh, how an individual's macro and or micro environment together with its interaction with host genetic factors can influence their susceptibility to disease, disease pathogenesis and outcomes. So welcome, Dr. Oyesola. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, just going to, can everyone see my screen? I don't, yeah. No? Okay, just wanna check. Just... Yes, okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. All right, just to kind of take it off, um, my project is um, majorly focused on soil transmitted helmets. And just to kind of, um, because this is really a general audience, I assume, just kind of emphasize that um, soil transmitted helmets infection is still um, um, a major disease and um, with about 2 billion people infected um, around the world. And you could see that there's indeed um, great, um, difference or um, in the location of where helmet infection is. So there's in the, like very um, differences in environmental or location of where helmet infections are majorly predisposed. So I just wanted to say that. And um, usually or naturally what biomedical scientists have done is to kind of use mouse model to try to ask questions as to um, in understanding how immune responses are generated during parasitic helmets. And some of this work has involved using different strain of mice to kind of probe how um, the outcomes during helminth infection. And what could previously done by others have shown that um, host genetic factors can influence susceptibility to intestinal helminth infection. For example, um, different strain of mice, when we look at different strain of mice, we have um, differences in um, warm body, um, suggesting that um, genetic factors can indeed influence susceptibility to intestinal helminth infection. 
And um, several other people in the field have also shown that resistance or susceptibility to um, intestinal helminth infection can be based on um, the type of immune response that is generated with when you have um, a type When you have like a TH2 response, there is, is usually um, associated with resistance. And when the immune response is predominantly a type one, um, immune response is associated with susceptibility, especially during trichuris infection. Um, work um, done previously in collaboration with our lab um, from as well as la um, Andrea Graham's lab has also shown that um, environment, um, the environment of an individual or mice in mice models in this case, can also dictate um, susceptibility to intestinal helminth infection. So for example, um, using the rewilding model, they've shown that um, rewilding of mice, um, mice that are rewilded either for a short term or a long term would have higher warm body compared to the lab mice. And they also looked at the um, mass, the warm biomass, so like this is like phenotypic characterization of the warm, and similarly the environment can also influence susceptibility to harm in intestinal immune infection. But really, I think where the gap is in the field is like, are there any interactions between genetic factors and environment in driving um, immune variation and susceptibility to home infection? So this remains an open question in the field that we don't really have an, an answer to. So today, um, what I hope at the end of this talk is that um, I'll be sharing with you that ensuring that really genetic factors, genetic factors, as well as environmental factors can interact to determine immune variation as well as um, susceptibility to harm with infection. And in case you didn't get it, my name is Uyebola, I go by Bola. Um, for sure, and um, in the look lab um, here at the NIH. So, um, work published in our lab in 2020 um, also um, shown using this rewarding model, trying to figure out what's the co um, contribution of the environment versus host genetic factors in influencing immune variation. Um, here we use um, point um, mutations, mice that have point mutations, as well as wild type mice. And when um, the immune profile is analyzed from the blood, we see that um, the environment has a big effect in determining the immune composition of, um, of, of um, cells in the blood. However, when we look at cytokine production and um, function of the cells, um, it seems like really the host genetic factor has a big um, influence in determining immune variation. Um, this then led us to come up or led the lab to come up with this um, model whereby we think that really what happens is that in individuals, um, environment has a big role in determining the composition of the immune cells and the number of immune cells, while host genetic factor really has a big role to play in determining the the function of the cell, as well as the um, cell to cell responsiveness. Um, but like I said, the question is, do they interact as at all in determining variation in immune responses? So to try to ask this question in 2021 in collaboration with, uh, um, with um, our colleagues at Princeton, as well as NYU, we set up to ask this question using um, different strain of mice has been done previously in this field, as well as um, we know that these strains of mice have wild genetic variation that kind of mimics what we see in the human population. And so we will use three different strain of mice, the B6 mice, the 129 mice, and the PWK mice. And then some of them were kept in the lab as control, and some of them were rewarded. Um, to assess the effect of um, helmet infection, we left some of them. Some of them were infected with trichuris muris, um, and then some were left 
but left uninfected. Um, so we took the blood as well as the mesenteric lymph node, which is like the lymph node that drains the gut um, where the intestinal helmets um, um, reside, and then looked at um, immune variation um, using um, flow cytometry panel. So um, just to kind of give you a preview into when I say rewilded, what, what do we really mean when I talk about rewilding? And that means that um, the mice are put into an outdoor enclosure like this, where they can interact and have access to the food and um, you know microbes in the environment. Um, based on our assessment, we know that they don't really pick up any major pathogen that we screen for, but they're just left in this enclosure. And you can see some of the mice moving in here, just having fun. You know, they're not in a cage, you know, they're just moving around and um, enjoying. Um, you can see some of them eating stuff um, in the field as well. So it's just like having a normal activity, um, which is, that's what we define as being rewarded. So in this experiment, uh, we took the... Um, um, the blood and then using a lymphocyte panel that we have, um, um, we use that to analyze the blood of all these different strain of mice, some that were rewired and some that were in the lab, and then a little bit of those that were infected as well. And um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show this PCA plot to demonstrate what we see in, in, in the PBMC. And um, just to kind of explain, each dot really refers to each mice um, that we processed. And we use um, a software developed by a past lab member, Joe um, Cooper, Joseph Devlin, in our lab. And that allows us to be able to look at um, the clustering of the immune cells based on um, this flow panel here. And really what we see is that, um, we see that when the mice are in the lab, there is um, huge variation, huge what we call a genotype effect on the um, on variation in immune responses. But you could also see on PC1 here, you could also see that there seems to be an effect of the environment. So the environment has an, seems to have an influence on immune variation um, and, and, um, and host genetic factor. The different strain of mice also have an influence on um, immune variation. And that can be quantified here in that um, PC1, which is where we have the environments um, induced variation, you see a significant difference. And on PC2, you also see um, a significant um, difference as well. But this is what, when I say, um, when we talk about interaction, what it seems, what Oh, when I was saying that, it seems like the host genetic factor, which which is right here on PC2, seems to decrease when the mice are rewarded. And you can see that some of this big difference that we see in the lab, it's no longer there when the mice are rewarded. So um, to ask this question, are there interactions between genet host genetic factors and environment, um, as well as exposure to um, parasites um, is a critical in determining immune variation. Um, so we use a um, mathematical model. Um, got a lot of help from Alex, Suching, and Andrea in doing this analysis. And what we see from processing the immune cells from the blood is that the host um, host genetic factors and environment seems to interact in determining um, immune variation. And you can see this three-way interaction as well um, happening uh, happening um, when we look in the blood. Um, and like I said, there is that narrowing that we see once the mice is, is rewarded. But um, outside this interaction, we also see that regardless of this interaction, the host genetic factor still seems to play a huge role in determining immune variation um, in, in the mice that we're looking at. And then the environment also has an effect, but really the infection or exposure to trichurismaris doesn't seem to have any effect um, 
by itself on when we look in in, in the messenger in the blood rather so um then as immunologists the question then is what are the factors driving this genetic and environmental variation and then we can look at the loading factor um this the population that is driving this um this environmental variation seems to be this non t cell non b cell um, population but the k67 positive and CD44 positive cells. Um, we don't have enough marker in a panel um, in that year to be able to really figure out which population it is, but it seems like it's like an innate population, like innate immune cell population. But really the, fa the major factors that are driving the differences in, in host genetic factors seems to be um, differences in expression of CD44 on the T cells. And then we can, the beauty of this is that we can then go back into, um, into, um, into our, um, our, um, we can go back into our analysis and um, look at this population in a more rigorous fashion. And what we see indeed is that when we look um, at CD44 expression, there are differences in, um, um, in expression of CD44 based on the genotype of the mice. But when the mice are rewilded, some of these differences are no longer seen, especially in the B6 mice and the PWK mice. But we do still, you know, some of those genetic effects still persist, even, even, even though there are interactions. So this expression of CD44 and the CD40 cell seems to be like a clear, um, clear um, example of um, a genotype by environment interaction. So I also mentioned that we looked in the MLN. So what happens in the MLN, which really drains the intestinal lymph you node, know, um, the intestine where the parasite resides in. So we use the same panel and then um, really the first thing that jumped us to us when we were dissecting these mice is that there were differences in really the size of the MLN, and you could probably appreciate this looking at the cell count from the MLN, in that um, you could see that this block, um, which is the 129, it looks different from, kind of different from the B6 mice, and the PWK mice are completely different. But then following infection with trichurismaries, you see an expansion as expected in the lab, and when they are rewarded, you see more so an expansion of cells um, in the in the 129. And I th we think that this this expansion is a clear demonstration of a genetic by environment um, interaction. So this is this also shows another example of how genetics and environments can really interact to determine immune variation even in um, lymph node that drains the tissue. We could also do the same um, um, clustering, um, looking at um, doing a PC analysis. And what we see even in the MLN is that um, on PC1, for example, we see a um, genotype dependent um, distribution in that the PWK mice is kind of clustering here, the B6 mice is clustered here, and then the 129 mice is clustered here. And then on PC2 access here, you see a clear environment dependent effect, um, suggesting that genetic factors and environment, uh, environmental factors can have an influence on immune variation in the ML. And this is quantified here and here as well. In data I'm not showing today, I think I'll get there. Okay, so this is also, we also test using the same model, um, the multivariate distance matrix regression. We also tested for um, interaction. And indeed we do see um, a genotype by environment and by um, infection um, status interaction in suggesting that these three factors can um, interact to influence differences in immune profile in, in the mesenteric lymph node. 
Um, but I think one thing that seems to jump out at, at us when we looked at the fixed effects, um, the effects that is left behind, is that um, in the MLN there is the um, trichuris muris um, exposure to the worm seems to have more effect on um, on the MLN compared to the blood where we don't see significant effect of infection um, status, suggesting that even though in the field or um, what we generally do is to look at the PBMCs that might not really give us the whole picture of what is happening in individuals that are infected with um, helmets. We can also look at um, loading factors and here um, what are the factors that are driving this environment and genetic differences. And really what we see is that it seems like differences in B cell population is driving this environment dependent variation while differences in T cells is really driving this um, genetic dependent variation. And this is something that has been reported previously, and so it's nice to see that a data even in, in mice model and um, using the rewarding model also um, for the emphasize this at this point. And this is shown here um, when we look at B cells, you could see that um, following in rewarded mice, you see um, there's a shift in, in the expression of CD44 and the B cells in all, in all the strains of mice. And then when we look on the T cells, there is um, differences um, in expression of CD44 and the CD4 T cells. Um, based on the strain of mice, demonstrating the genetic influence um, on immune variation. So um, so we've looked at cellular composition, but, but then the question is, um, how does this influence cytokine response? How does this influence um, function of, of the cells both in the blood as well as in the MLM? And um, so we could look at plasma cytokines level in, in the in the blood. And when we do a, a legend plex assay to, to look at this, I'm just going to show this, um, the interferon gamma, so that we don't get overwhelmed. What you can see is when you look at um, the 129, there seems to um, be increase in interferon gamma levels when the mice are rewilded and infected. And that looks different from what we see in um, in the B6 mice. And nothing really came up for, for this PWK mice. And when you look at the whole heat map, um, it just seems like all the different strain of mice were um, looks, they all look um, very different, um, suggesting that there might be um, a, an host genetic factor driving, driving this difference. So using the same model that we would develop, we could um, quantify this. And indeed, when we did the quantification, we see that the host genetic factor um, has the biggest effect um, in driving immune variation, while environment or infection status really doesn't influence the plasma cytokine levels at all. And we don't see any interactions. Um, so this is this is really confirmed what has been previously published by our group that um, host genetic factors has, has an influence on cytokine responses on function and maybe less so um, the environment, at least when we look um, in the blood. But then what happens in the MLN since um, there is this difference in um, immune composition when we look at in the in the blood versus the hemolin and their differences in function as well. So to ask this question, what we did is we took hemolin for, from all the different strain of mice that we're looking at, and then um, we had some as media alone. Then we stimulated some some of those either with different antigen or with CD3, CD28 um, core stimulation. And then we did the legend plex assay um, um, to us for cytokine analysis. And when we did this, um, compared to what we see in the blood, we do see and we do observe um, um, in that indeed there are interactions between genetic host genetic factors and um, environments as well as between host genetic factors and the infection status of the of the host. 
But then um, when we look at the fixed effect alone, host genetics factor seems to have the most effect on, 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 on the cytokine level in, in, in the MLN, which is similar to what we see in the blood as well. So to kind of just summarize all of this um, that I've shown you, what I've shown, I've shown here is that um, there are interactions between host genetic factors and environment as well as exposure to parasites in determining the variation um, in immune composition, both in the blood as well as in the hemorrhage. And that phenotypic differences in, in, in B cells really drive these environment related differences, while um, phenotypic differences in T cells drive, um, seems to have drive the genetic related difference put in the blood and in the animal. And that after accounting for interaction, either we look at host um, composition or function, it seems like the host genetic factor account the most for variation in immune composition and cytokine responses. Um, in data that I will not be showing today, um, analyzed by um, a wonderful post back in our lab, we, we observed similar things when we did single cell anal analysis from, from these cells as well, at least in the MLM. Um, but then as immunologists, I guess the question is, why do we care? So what, why do we care that there are in, that there are immune variation and how does this really influence warm clearance? So we could look at immune, um, the warm intensity in those mice. And what we see is that if we look in the lab, similar, um, we also see similar um, genetic um, influences on warm body. So one button here um, is defined as the number of worms that are counted. Also, when we look at worm prevalence, which is the number of worms, that, um, the number of mice that have um, worms, the percentage of mice that have worms, we also see, it also seems like there is um, also genetic, most genetic related effects in determining the prevalence um, of warm, warm, um, worms in, in, in the lab mice. So what happens when we rewild, rewild the mice similar to what we've seen before? We see that uh, um, rewilding leads to an increase, at least in some strain of mice in this case, leads to some increase in, in the warm body. And rewilding in all the strain of mice, rewilding leads to increase in, in the prevalence or in the percentage of mice that have worms. Um, and um, when we do an association or correlation between um, PC, um, PC2 values from our se single cell sequencing analysis, we see that there is a correlation between the worm count, um, or Andrea did this analysis, that she saw that there is a correlation between worm count and the PC2 values um, from a single cell RNA sequencing result. And that this, this is really, um, that there's, the, the worms that have higher worm bodies really uh, um, seems to have um, a greater TH1 response, especially in the B6 mice, which is something that has been reported previously. So the central question um, in the field still remains what matters the most in determining immune variation of outcomes? Is it genetic factor? Is it environmental factor? And um, I think it's still a question that we don't have a full answer to. Um, some people say, well, previous orders have said non-heritable non influences, which are really the environmental factors. And others have also said that um, host genetic factors really determine variation in cytokine responses in humans. And contrary to our hypothesis that um, environment have an influence really on just um, composition and genetic have an influence on function. What we're seeing 
is that this um, um, this model might be simple, too simple, but really what we have is that the main thing that is driving high immune variation in composition or in the production of cytokine is really the oxygenetic factor. But you can have interactions um, with environments. The environment can influence um, on the um, immune composition and, and number as well as um, cytokine responses as well. So I guess our working hypothesis is that the, the, gen the host genetic factors seems to win in this case. And um, summarized there that um, there are interactions, but genotype um, host genetic factor has bigger effects and it can be reduced um, by environmental change. And I feel like thinking about this in a big picture, I feel like our understanding of interactions between host genetic factors and environment is really critical, will be critical in the design and development of vaccines, not only for helminth parasites, but also for other, um, for other um, pathogens as well. So um, to kind of just to wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge my PI Pong look um, for really creating an awesome environment um, that has allowed me to thrive um, during my postdoc um, postdoctoral studies. And I, all the people I lighted here are uh, people that um, um, took part in the study and then as well as our collaborator Andrew Graham and Halleck Downing at Princeton um, as well as all the other um, members of the rewarding team and um, let's say thank you for listening and then I'll take any questions. Thank you very much Paula for this interesting talk. It's really interesting. I don't think we have actually a whole lot of time for questions, but we can take one or two. Uh, there's a question from Inis Fairbanks. Uh, she's saying, is there a different standard of ethics when using rewilded mice for experiments compared to the lab mice? Um, yeah, there are a lot of things. Thank you for the question. There are a lot of things that we can't do um, in the rewarded environment that we would want to do. Uh, but yeah, um, there are some ethical concerns, uh, but we make sure to follow all ethical um, protocols in, in this experiment. Cool. There's a question that I think you might have already mentioned or talked about, which is from David Schatz saying that, have you considered doing single cell RNA-seq to zero in on key populations? Yeah, so we've done single cell analysis. I just couldn't share those results. Um, yeah, it will be it will be nice to really zero in. Um, we're kind of still looking at, we've looked at the data holistically, um, but then really to kind of look at a population and see where there are similar things that we see in the flow with the T cell and B cell is driving this environment versus um, gen genetics um, variation, yeah. One last question from Irene, I think we could take it pretty quick because we are already out of time. Um, our photo period and diet, I think, circadian, I think, rhythm, I think, and diet are matched between the lab versus wilded, rewilded mice. Uh, uh, yeah, so no, diet is not matched at all. So um, um, we are... Uh, and of course, the microbiome might also be different, you know, between the lab mice versus the rewarded mice. These are all um, things that we'll put into environment category. Um, um, we're actually trying to do some um, sequencing of, um, um, of fecal material to see if we can narrow down some diet related differences as well. But yeah, that's not something we've looked at. And no, they're not matched. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bola, for this interesting talk. And thank you all for all of our speakers for their sharing their work and to the attendees for the questions. And uh, now we hope you will stick around for the immunology crossover session, which will start actually uh, now. Thank you very much. <laughs>